he must always line up himself with this, with this master's consciousness. Now, Jesus just use another word. The disciple should be like his master. He should line up. He has to raise his consciousness. Follow? So, discipline number two is the art of breath. Now, there are many techniques for breathing, but the most effective one that we're interested in is the one that occurs in you naturally to give you the identity. In this particular discipline or technique, you do not force or compel yourself to breathe. You do not hold the air in and you do not hold the air out. You merely observe yourself breathing. Because you are consciousness, life flowing through a cellular mechanism. And when you're ready to go permanently, you'll have to travel out on that same current. And any sense of desire or attachment when the frame falls over, you'll see, well, I lived in that shell and did not even know who I was. Now I'm outside of it, this is a shock. It is when I can go in and out of this, like taking clothes off and putting them on. Then I am free. So self-observation is focusing now. You're observing yourself performing a function. Well, let's try it. Observe yourself breathing. Don't attempt to stop it. Don't attempt to pull it in. Just observe the fact that you do breathe. Okay. Do you notice you have a tendency to feel sleepy? Sleepy. Uh, relaxed. Subdued. Now, picture for one moment you are on the boat with Master Jesus. You would automatically assume he was sound asleep. When a person is sound asleep, they cannot respond to you immediately the situations that are involved. They have to know what they're doing. And he opens his eyes and says, be not afraid. He knows what he's doing. You notice you did not become unconscious when you did it. You were highly conscious. And there are moments you seem not to be coming in, and there are moments you seem not to be going out. Now, as soon as you link up or synchronize with that movement, you do go out, and you do come in. <coughs> this is a different experience than astral projection. Here you know for sure now 
what Master Jesus meant, no man take my life from me. I have the power to lay it down and put it back in. Because he is conscious life identified. We're speaking of a different type of discipline, a different involvement with the spiritual force. Now let's take this same technique and go one step further. Sound is important. First it was sight, now it's breathing. Then we're going to go into hearing. The art of hearing. That involves the sound, the actual sound that is being made in the movement. The word that we can relate to sounds like something like soham, soham. When you watch the breath now, which you are disciplining the nostril, you want now to hear the sound and not just merely watch it. You want to hear the incoming sound and you want to hear the outgoing sound. It's in the hearing that identification and synchronization begins. You have to hear it to bring this synchronization. Now, you can repeat the word to strengthen your concentration or strengthen your focusing. But you must repeat it without moving the tongue. Now, this is going to be a little feat for the tongue, you know. That's the fourth little part that has to be disciplined. You don't want to move the tongue. You want to watch, and you want to hear, but you don't want to talk. Well, let's try it. The word that you're going to mentally repeat is so hum. Okay. Now we're going to intensify this hearing and synchronize it. When the incoming breath comes in, you mentally repeat hung. This is pronounced hum or hung and hear it, but don't speak it with the tongue. And as it goes out, you mentally repeat without moving the tongue and hearing it, so. 
you are synchronizing this sound with the movement. Now slowly open the eyes <coughs> and focus it forward. in a half open state. Now let the air come in and let the sound be hung as you hear it and you mentally affirm it and let the air go out and mentally affirm so. Okay. The next discipline is touch. In the East, they usually see them holding their hands like this to indicate touch, controlling of your life energy. But we're going to go to a more effective method indicating touch. indicating touch. I want you to place your left thumb on your right wrist and locate, locate the pulse beat. Now, that pulse beat is going to act like a built-in rosary. Like a built-in metronome. The time cycle, the relationship between the word soham and the breath. As you breathe in to one pulse beat, you breathe out the next pulse beat. And you breathe in, you mentally repeat the word, hong. You breathe out, you repeat the word, saw. So. 
mentally. Now, you do this with focusing. So you can close the eyes and focus, or partially open the eyes and focus. So. Okay. Now the whole body is feeling. I give a little story that I encountered on the reservation. One day a chieftain was standing up in the mountain, you know, with snow. And uh, there was a minister from the Assembly of God Church all covered up with his parka and cold. And up there is pretty cold. So he's standing next to the chief. All the chief had was a big blanket standing up looking out across the mountain. The minister said to him, Chief, don't you feel cold? Because all he saw was just a sandal in this blanket hair, face, and everything open. So the chief says, tell me, friend, do you cover your face in the winter time? He says, oh no, that's my face. Then the chief pulled aside the blanket. He was in his birthday suit. He says, me all face. <laughs> <laughs> that was a prayer technique I learned. See, I was looking for a prayer technique among some of the Indian tribes. And when confronted with some unusual things, I realized they knew more of what this inner life was than we give them credit. Well, the priest, the uh, minister immediately realized that he wasn't functioning in that level. He did learn, after a while, to get rid of his big parka and uh, diminish a great deal of his clothing, but not to the extent that he could wrap himself in the blanket. He had to learn more of that. But he learned a great deal about himself. Since the whole body is all feeling, or all face, we are going to be 
involved with the most difficult part of the discipline, the, f the discipline of feeling. Now, when you meditate and you practice, you, do you notice at times your body gets stiff, like certain portions seem to shut off? Then you start to worry. The sensations like if it's getting numb. This is because feeling is slowly diminishing in each area, or in many areas. But the mind craving sensation and programmed to the fact that if you don't feel something is wrong, immediately sets up an alarm system and end of meditation. In the discipline of bodily sensation, you have to reach the point of withdrawal that you relax it and don't feel anything. Someone should go ahead and tap you. That's why if you practice with another brother or sister in the room, they can test if you have reached that state where you are withdrawn. It's not too wise to be by yourself when you go into that state because you're going to have doubts about yourself. So group meditation becomes important. The group discipline becomes important by having someone go around the room while they're meditating and ri arriving at that level and checking you. This is an actual discipline to know that you are making progress in this withdrawal. How long you can stay inside, outside the range of feeling, determines the strength of the focusing of the consciousness. That you can handle something now in a tangible way. These masters who realize themselves, have withdrawn to that point where they're fully identified that they can say, I am not the body. But they don't intellectualize. They know positively they are in a state of beingness and they walk. And there is no such sensation that the normal man. In the case of Mahatma Gandhi, when they operated on him to take out his appendix, there was no medical drugs used to deaden the pain. And he kept on a long conversation while they were busy cutting open and taking out the appendix. You see what I'm talking about? The withdrawal of the consciousness from the physical frame in a conscious way to the extent that you can go ahead and work. There is no relationship to a sensation. Now, this tells you an interesting story, or throws an in interesting sidelight to the crucifixion on the cross. Last night, everyone thought it was a horrible death. Nailing someone to the cross, Look at the agony and the pain he's going to go through. Who would want it? A realized master knows his mechanism thoroughly. And when they nail him, he wouldn't feel it. And then Swami, the master who initiated me into Swamihood, when I met him, told me an interesting story about his life, and he carries a scar to bear it. He said, I was practicing my basic disciplines on feeling. I was initiated at the age of 14. 
And when I was 65, ready to retire from this world, I decided to go visit my teacher. All these years, he said, I did not see anything inside, heard anything. It was all blank. But now I'm 65 years, ready to retire. I'm going to go and see my spiritual teacher and ask him why I'm not getting progress. He went to see his teacher, thinking he would see an elderly man with long beard and gray and haggard. He saw someone looking half the age of himself. He said to his teacher, I don't see anything. I'm not making progress. I've been doing all the disciplines required, and I'm not making progress. So his teacher said to him, tell me, how long can you really sit down and meditate without getting restless? He says, two hours. Now, from 14 to 65, and end up with a statement of two hours. Boy, I said to myself that I heard that I got a long way to go. At 65, he said he was able to sit down for two hours without interruption. But I realized what he was talking inwardly. The teacher says, show me. So he sat down put himself in the lotus position, and this is a very difficult position for a man of 65. And it will entail a great deal of uh, aches and pains if you are not limber enough. He sat down and he meditating. At the end of one hour, his teacher took an old rusty nail, watched the calf of the leg, and nailed him to the floor and waited. He opened his eyes at the end of two hours, and he said, you see, teacher, I don't see anything, I don't hear anything, and I'm not restless. That just that time I started to get restless, I came out. So the teacher says, well, take a good look at yourself. And he looked. There was the nail pinned his leg down to the ground. <laughs> he can't move it. He has to yank it loose. Then the teacher says, I'm not going to heal it. I'm going to leave the scar for you to remember how far you were in God. And he carries his car, punch her right through. Then he said to me, this is what a master goes through. Therefore, when he said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world, Master Jesus was not suffering, and then he sent to the word when he was on the cross. He had reached that level. The discipline of feeling. Now, there's one more discipline, and there are many more, but uh, I have to go to one that is in order to save time, which everyone seems to remember very much. The discipline of the abdomen. Food. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And in all my studies in the Eastern practices, fasting is often emphasized as a discipline for the body. When you practice fasting, there is an unusual quality that comes out of the body. I'll leave it right here for now and take a break and ask questions after. The mind wanders and you don't know how to control it. And someone who has meditated long enough to see the movements of the mind, he, with the power of his consciousness, can 
bring it back. Tomorrow when we do meditation, we will show you how the mind can bring your consciousness to the various centers and move them. This is what we call lining you up. You take a car to a mechanic who tunes it up, the carburation, so it will run properly. The person who has to lead the meditation has this capacity of lining up your centers. That's why the masters are always with their disciples, to line them up. You can't line yourself up. You do not know at what level your plexuses are working. You don't know at what <coughs> rate your own chakras are working, or what you call the seven stars or golden candlesticks, symbolically speaking, the vortices of energy inside. You don't know how they're working. It does need someone. Now, this is where you come to the word Swami. Swa means self, means master. He who has mastered the electrical movements of the mechanism. You mean a master, you know, what, what you were thinking? Yes. Was the no. You're telegraphing it electrically to him. Mind. Mm -hmm. It could telegraph the cross because you see, thought is energy, and energy is moving at the speed of light squared, and he is lined up as a resonator. His pineal gland has certain crystals, which has a piezoelectric effect, and picks up your frequency. And therefore, when he puts on uh, a calibration, he's calibrating everyone. All right, reading your mind. <laughs> Gradually, your pulse will slow down. This is what the discipline is supposed to bring, a slowing down of that pulse beat as you observe it. You see, when the body is sometimes toxic, it does do that. But uh, you should be able eventually to see it slowing down in your daily practice. It will slow down gradually. And what is to be observed when you come out? If you're tired or you're more relaxed. Were you tired or were you more relaxed? Good. Then you made progress. Yes. The, uh, the meaning of the chant and the exact purpose of the chant. The meaning is, I am He. The no, purpose. I don't, I don't mean so hard. I mean the, the uh, universal, the, the, uh, uh, the universal. Um, um, is just the vocal cord trying to identify with the cosmic vibration of how it sounds. So you are relating to it language-wise. Every time you say it in a vocal way, to some extent, you are taking the name of God in vain. You are breaking the second commandment. Hmm? When you try to Imitate that sound with the vocal cords. To some extent, you are breaking a second commandment. Because the vocal cord can never really repeat that song properly. It's only in consciousness. So we do try to sing it, but that is not to be used as a means of uh, generating any consciousness with it. Because it's already there vibrating. It's making a sound by itself. We're trying to relate to it mentally. Now, there's a big difference of relating to the sound OM mentally than relating to the sound orally. Try it. One represents, when taken orally, a violation of the second commandment. <coughs> One, when taken mentally, is a fulfillment of the second verse of the Lord's Prayer. What is the second verse of the Lord's Prayer? 
Hello. You can't hello something if you shout it because your, the energy is going away from you. To hollow it, you have to conserve it and pull it back and synchronize with it. What is the purpose of some of these uh, Christian devotees uh, going along the street with a tambourine and chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, oh. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Rama? Rama, 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 It generates great devotion, but no realization. Do you want to say something? Uh, you didn't mention the discipline of silence. Yes. Is that not a very important discipline to learn to be quiet, learn to be still? Yes. All these disciplines end up as be thou still and know that I am God. They are all funneled into this experience of silence. But to say to someone, be silent, you know what's going to happen? You may have diarrhea of the mouth. <laughs> Could you explain the laws involved in Jesus' resurrection? Well, you'd have to back up before resurrection. Remember, he did not die on the cross. Well, the term used, he gave up the ghost. Now, literally, when you crucify a man, you nail him in order that he should suffer a long time and would beg you to end his agony. And this can go on for days, let alone from uh, 9 o'clock in the morning to about 5 o'clock in the afternoon in one day. Before the, f the evening came that they were going to take him down from the cross, it stated he gave up the ghost. Now, People went and asked for the body. The Romans were doubtful that this man was dead from their experience of this particular type of death. And then a soldier went to make verification. What did he do? Yeah. But there was no sound out of the body. So the Roman soldier was satisfied that he was dead. That's how much we are unfamiliar with the laws of the mechanism. Granted that he is not making any sound, a pierce with a spear in that area is sufficient to agree that he is dead. Okay, have the body, take it down. A master is capable, as I said, not astral projection, Taking the life energy out with his consciousness and riding on that current and leaving the body in a state of suspended animation. Now that body would not decay, let alone he's in another dimension now where he can start rebuilding the body if they put it in the earth. He's in a different dimension now. He has control over this mechanism. Resurrection is like your butterfly coming out of the cocoon when it was once a caterpillar. It's a distinct new creature. Have anyone ever seen a rotten butterfly? What would a resurrected body represent? A non-decaying body in the first place. It would have to, and it would have to build up from the very atomic structure that is there. So, he 
was aware of how to cycle the energies in the electrical mechanism that you call the astral body. But the electrical mechanism has 19 elements. The physical mechanism has 16 plus trace elements. And being aware of how these two forces work in combination, he cycled it with his ideational body, which is comprised of 35 elements, thereby removing all the carbon that would not allow it to cast any shadow, but bring it to a condition where it will transmit light. Now, there are two types of carbon. One inhibits light, and one permits light to pass. Which one inhibits light? And which one permits light to pass? So he, the diamond body is often referred to Indian writings, yoga writings, Chinese writings, as the ideal body of the God-man. Be ye diamond-bodied in spirit, O man. Now we know that he is referring to this physical transformation inside. There is a book among the Chinese people, and my father used to have it. And he spoke in Mongolian. He says, uh, everyone think I am not a Christian, because they were all Catholics, you know. He says, but I don't think they even appreciate their Jesus, because they don't seem to have a diamond body. <laughs> the diamond body is what we're talking about. Now, the one aspect is about the resurrected body. It casts no shadow once it's cycled up. It leaves no footprint and has the odor of perfume all around it. And that perfume is the odor of roses when it enters the room. One distinct feature when it eats it does not eat with the mouth. If intravenous can feed a human being, the resurrected body can draw energy out of the physical substance with the hand by just touching it. But the peace that it will leave in the room to satisfy the disciple will not decay. And that's the evidence that that disciple has met the resurrected master. There is no decaying of that little evidence. When Master Yogananda was in the body, he said to his disciples, You meditate at Christmas. I love you very much, but that's not enough. I want you all to meditate till you confront the Master Jesus and give you evidence of his resurrected body. Then you can vouch that such a thing does exist. Until that time, don't say that you know anything about resurrection. Rather, pursue your disciplines and try to get there. So he used to tell them to meditate. First, to see Christ inside. This is where we come to contemplation, seeing the radiant form of the Master. Then we meditate until you can see him outside. That is manifestation. But that's not enough because that can also create hallucination. Then you meditate until it talks to you by the eyes. And that is not enough. You meditate until you see the whole body, not just half a body, three quarter of a body, the whole body. And it must convince you that it can eat. And you meditate to the point when you offer it something. And it does partake and leave you the evidence you need. Then you know you have faced the reality of your destination. Man ought to be perfect. Such evidence doesn't exist. 
must have been tried long enough and hard enough to actually have this evidence of the major confrontation? Yes. If someone meditate long enough, it's not just mere meditating. You must meditate with love. How many of us meditate with love? Don't we all do meditation in a mechanical way? Are we meditating with love when we meditate? Think of it. You sit down to pray and commune. But do you bring up love inside the communion? When the Master said we should do this, he was inferring that we have to bring love. It's a peculiar force. That confrontation or that experience cannot be forthcoming if there is no total love. Because the very first commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all your mind, all your heart, strength and soul. I think our time is running out. How much time do I have? Five minutes. If I have ever met Master Yogananda, In 1948, I was blessed by his body in my room while I was living in Canada, and he was living in Los Angeles. No, he was alive. He wasn't dead when I had the experience. No, I had other experiences, but not of that caliber. There's a big difference when a realized master in the body grants you the experience of that communication. I did not know who he was when I had the experience. But a day later, I found out. I found his autobiography of a yogi. And when I read it, he was a living man. So you can imagine I wanted to make communication. So when I wrote him, the message he gave me when he came into my room was exactly the same message when he replied to my letter. <coughs> Master Jesus? While I was in Utah, I've had that experience by the grace of the Master. Master Jesus is not six feet tall, though. He's five feet eleven. What's he look like? What's he look like? What's his face? Uh, he looks like a Greek texture. The texture of his face is like... No, he has hazel eyes. Hazel eyes? Yeah, hazel eyes. The texture of his skin is like a Greek, a young person. And the hair is auburn color, brownish. Hey, more of the brownish color. Yes, it's long, and it's the beard is sparse. Reddish, yeah. Well, when you say gray, it's not really gray. It's because he's capable of fixing it, that it filters light. You see? That's why it looks like that. The only man who actually had an opportunity to paint him when, while he posed for him was the Solomon head. No, the Hoffman head. Hoffman, the artist, had two visitations <laughs> by the Master Jesus where he posed to let him paint the head. So the only head that looks in authenticity of what he is is the Hoffman head. Next to that would be the uh, napkin of Veronica. But in that state, the body was in suspended animation. The 
because when he he pressed the he was already putting his body into suspended animation, consciously walking, preparing himself for the cross. You see, this is a difference in the expressions. But it's there. You can make your own test. Okay, let you go.